morning, everyone. Welcome to Titusville First United Methodist Church. If you're here in the congregation with us, or if you're viewing on television or internet, we welcome everyone on this beautiful day in Pennsylvania. Uh, I know everybody's enjoying the, the nice temperatures that we're having, and, uh, but we're glad to see every, those that are able to be out here to worship with us. Uh, we have only one major announcement You've, we've enjoyed the beautiful Christmas decorations, but the time has come. Next Saturday at 9 o'clock, it will be time to remove the decorations, so anyone that could help, come and help do that would be appreciated. Do you have an announcement? <laughs> no announcement. She's just ready to sing. If there are no other announcements, Will you stand and join me for the call to worship? Let all the earth procla proclaim the goodness of her God. Our God has expressed the gratitude which we feel in our hearts. Share the good news. Tell everyone of the salvation offered by Christ. Let it spill over into, our, into the lives of those who have yet to be touched. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 245, The First Noel. Now, will you share your greetings with those around you?
ushers will wait upon you for offerings and tithes. just like the shepherds who came and knelt before Jesus and the wise men who came and knelt before Jesus and brought their gifts. We bring our gifts and we kneel in our hearts before you. We pray that you bless these gifts, that you work in the lives of each giver and that you use these for your kingdom in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Will the children please come forward? What year is this? This is 2017? 2018? All right. All right, so it's a new year. Good thing. How many of you have taken the decorations down at your house already? Excellent, excellent. I want you to know my snowman is out on the porch until tonight. Got to bring him in tonight. I'll tell you why. I noticed that we still have some lights on and enjoying the Christmas decorations. Pastor Lee already mentioned that. This is what's called Epiphany Sunday. Can you say Epiphany? Let's see if the congregation say Can you say epiphany? epiphany. Can you spell it? <laughs> uh, we're not sure about that. E-P-I-P-H-A-N-Y. How's that sound, school teacher? I know. We'll just say yes. It says right. Margie says we're okay on that, all right? 
But let me tell you about epiphany. It kind of means manifestation, whatever that word means. But let me tell you what it was. Remember, Jesus was, was Jewish. And the Messiah was to come to the, to, the, uh, to the Jewish folks. Then, whenever the Messiah came, remember, that the, the, remember how the, the shepherds came and knelt before Jesus? And then, what is really cool, is the wise men came, probably at a later date. The wise men came and they brought gifts, right? Gold and smartphones. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh they brought, right? So they brought gifts for, for, for the baby Jesus, fit for a king, by the way. So the reason that we celebrate Epiphany and talk about it out loud, this is called Epiphany Sunday. Yesterday was the, the official day of Epiphany. But this is called Epiphany Sunday because it's, it's when God revealed himself to the people who weren't Jewish, to those of us. We're Gentiles, by the way. If you didn't grow up in a Jewish home, you're a Gentile. I don't know if you like being a Gentile or not, but that's why. So we celebrate Epiphany for that reason. So having done that, um, it's good enough. I just want to make sure that, that you got, knew that and knew why we're doing that. And also, you're welcome to come back when we come on Saturday. Tell your parents we'll be here about 9 o'clock on Saturday trying to take some of these things down. Um, I brought some money with me. You can't buy much for this. It's play money. But it's still pretty cool. Still pretty cool. You might have one of your friends that doesn't know it, and you might want to try to pass it off on them. I'm just kidding. That would be wrong. How many of you, how many of you like money? Yeah. Oh, I love the honesty of you folks here. We do like money, don't we? Um, all right, so then we, don't, we wouldn't mind being rich, right? No. Well, what I would do is I would just give it to them. I, I can imagine what you would do, Josiah. Yeah, and you'd be willing to help other people who struggle with that to let them give you their money and then you would make sure you handled it the right way, right? All right, that's why this, this money just represents the desire that we had to be riches. But, now let me just try something else. Here, I brought, uh, I brought a beverage here. Do any of you recognize this symbol? Pepsi. 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 It stands for PepsiCo or, or PepsiCola Company or whatever it stands for, right? Pepsi, and any time you see a drink that has that look on it, you expect it to drink to taste like what you think it's going to taste like. So if, and, and, uh, and fortunately, your parents love you too much to let you have too much of this, okay? But, but this only works as long as it really does taste like it. Now, I've gone to, to places before that have a fountain drink. You know what that's like, where you stick your cup in, you get some ice on it, and then you, and then you, and you let the, you pour it and let the drink come in. That's called a fountain drink, all right? I, I've done it before, and I've tasted it, and it, well, let's, let me just try it. This is just, for, this is just for ministry, by the way. It has nothing to do with anything else. Well, let me just say Oh, that tastes like Pepsi. Just like what it says. But I've had fountain drinks before that even though it says Pepsi, when I taste it, it doesn't taste right. Why is it? Sometimes there's too much carbonation or there's too much syrup or one of them's lacking and it makes for a really lousy drink. And you know, there are even restaurants that, that if, I think that they're, if I think that their soft drink thing isn't very good, I would rather not go to that restaurant because it tastes so bad, right? And if that fountain is good, I'm, not so, I'm really concerned about their water, what the water will taste like. So Pepsi really relies on the fact that you and I know what it should taste like. Now, here's what the scriptures say. In other words, Pepsi relies on this good name. Proverbs chapter 22, we're going to look at this today basically says this, and in verse 1, I'm going to paraphrase it. it. says, a good name is better than riches. Think about that. A good name is better than riches. What I think the writer of Proverbs is saying at that point is it's much better for people to know that, that uh, uh, it's Madison, right? It's better to know that Madison's name and to know that she's trustworthy than for her to be rich. Now, your dad's loaded, I happen to know that. You know, but, but just it's better for you to have a great name than, than, than for, for Harry and Tina, and for all of you just to, to, to have a reputation for being wealthy. Josiah, it's better to have a good name, and you got a great name too. Better to have a good name than to be just caught up in whether or not we have riches. Same way for each of you, right on down the thing, right? By name, though, it isn't just the name that we're given. 
It's that our reputation is that we love Jesus and that we can be dependent on, that we're kind to one another, that type of thing, okay? So just a reminder, the scripture says, it's, uh, it's good to have riches, but it's better to have a name or to be trustworthy as one who loves God, okay? And if you just nod your head, we're going to agree on that. I've got some play money to give you today. <laughs> Very good. I got some play money to give you today, and after we pray, I want you to take one of these as we get ready to take up the offering, okay? And, uh, and, if, and if any of this finds it in way in the offering, we have people who count who knows the difference, okay? I just want you to understand it. All right, good. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for my young friends here. They have good names. Their reputation is already growing as people who love you. You're helping them learn to do what is right. You're helping them to be kind to other people. You're helping them to be trustworthy. You're helping them to, like a song we're going to sing a little bit, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I do pray, Lord, that you will cause them to have a good name uh, and that we will know that they belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anyone want to play money before you go? Yes, yes no? <laughs> nope, okay. Pass it on that. She's going for the good name. Here you go. Yep, yep, yep.
whenever we gather out of the cold of winter into the warmth of the sanctuary, into the warmth of Christian fellowship, we are called to open up our hearts and minds in prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ. May we bow. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for the, the, the children who are here this morning to hear the message from Pastor Larry about having a good name. We're thankful that as we listen to that message, we are reminded uh, of the many things that we must do to have a good name, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for the offering that they're able to uh, take this morning, that it might be used to spread the good name of Titusville First United Methodist Church, for we want to support all of those missions that, that we name to uh, help, help the name of our church be spread in, into the world and help the name of Jesus Christ spread into the world. We thank you, Father, for calling us to come together. We recognize the cold of winter, but in the cold of winter and, and in the beauty of the snow, uh, we also have the opportunity uh, of the warmth of love and fellowship when we gather together. So we praise you for that. We thank you, Father, that uh, when we come together, we are able to lift up those around us those who might be suffering from sickness or illness. Uh, we know that uh, there are many things like that that uh, go on in the world around us. And, and we, we lift them up to you, knowing that you are aware of each and every one. We thank, thank you again for bringing us together. Be with us as we lift up our songs of praise. Lift up our, our silent prayers as we sit here in the pews or, or as we um, think about the, the things around us that might um, call us to, to lift them up to you. We thank you again for doing that. We thank you for the opportunity to lift up the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture this morning is coming to us from an Old Testament reading, Proverbs chapter 22, selected verses. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Verse 8. He who sows wickedness reaps trouble, and the rod of his fury will be destroyed. A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. 22. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court. For the Lord will take up their case, and will plunder those who plunder them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So, this is what people look like who take a risk and come out on a cold morning, huh? Really, really good to see you. And we certainly would have been understanding if you felt like you could not be here today. I think that the temperature has gushed clear up to at least zero by now, and it might actually be climbing more than that, right? So that's pretty good. Well, today I'm 
using a word called quid, or a phrase called quid pro quo. It's a Latin phrase. I put no down there for it, but it's a Latin phrase. And I've uh, uh, probably best described by a cartoon that I had seen one time. The, in the cartoon, the uh, two, uh, a man and a woman are eating a, 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 their dinner, and they're at a seafood restaurant. Seafood is key here, okay? They're at a seafood restaurant, and they both have their plate of food. And uh, the gentleman says to the one, the one he's eating with, he says, I will gladly let you have a, a bite of my calamari if I can have a bite of your stuffed shrimp. And underneath the, the caption says, squid pro quo. All right? <laughs> now, don't blame me. It's a cartoon. I didn't do the cartoon. I'm just telling you. That's what it says on that. Quid pro quo. I've got the definition for you right there. Uh, it's a favor or advantage granted for ex. You know, in this grand or expected a return for something. You can also see some of the synonyms, exchange or trade, trade off, swap, switch, barter, substitute, uh, reciprocate or reciprocation, return. We have other phrases that are like that, something for something or tit for tat. Uh, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. You get the idea. It's basically what commerce is built on. I give you $5, you give me a cheeseburger, and if you're really generous, I can talk you out of some fries with that as well. Okay, quid pro quo. I do something for you, you do something for me. It is a phrase that's neutral. I see it in the legal world all the time. When I watch those uh, shows that, 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 that show court, I see the, the phrase quid pro quo coming up. I've been hearing it a lot in the political realm lately as well. Uh, we've been hearing it as well with all the sexual harassment uh, claims that are going on around the country and in, and in, and in so many uh, really visible places, all right? Uh, so quid pro quo. It is, uh, it is av expecting some kind of a favor for something else that I give. I'm not going to recommend this movie, but you might remember a movie called Silence of the Lamb. Uh, uh, can anyone help me know what this guy's name was? Anthony Hopkins. I know, but what was, his what was the name for this movie? Yeah. Hannibal Lecter. Now, you can tell I can remember this movie really well. I do remember this movie. And it was one of those movies, there are lots of movies I watched, I'm watching that again. This one I watched and say, I'm not watching that one again, okay? But Hannibal Lecter, he, he's, he's, he's mean. He is wicked. Uh, he eats people. I think that's what that's about. You know, kind of. You know, I mean, he just had just destroyed it and mercilessly, mercilessly uh, wounded people. And he's in jail, and he's in jail for life. And he will do anything in order to get a little bit lighter sentence. The sentence is going to be the same, but if he could get transferred to an island, to a hospital, where he could see out a window sometimes or see the sky, he's up for that. So he has key information about a, about a little girl who is captured, and, uh, and no one is ever going to find it, but he has some information about it, and he knows the one doing it, and he seems to understand this. So he is willing to offer a little bit of information, clues as to how to find the girl, as long as he gets back and return what he wants. So Clarice, which was played by Jodie Foster, is, is, the, is a policewoman that's working with him at that point. And so he's already made his list of demands. Then he goes a little further and a little creepier, I might add. He says, oh, it's going to be more than this, Clarice. He says, you tell me things about yourself, and I'll tell you more things about this case. Not an ounce of goodness in his heart. But he was at least willing to do something if he could get something in return. That's how quid pro quo is a little bit different from what the arrangements that God has for us whenever we show kindness to anyone for something. Quid pro quo is probably a neutral, not neither positive nor negative per se, but when we get to Proverbs, is that quid pro quo? The generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. When you do an act of kindness, is that, is that what it's for? Uh, in order for you to receive the blessing? I'm not saying you don't get a blessing, but is that what the motive is, is the question. Are you generous for the sake of getting a blessing? Are you kind to one another to get God's reward? There's a lot of, uh, I'm going to be talking about a 30-day kindness challenge a little bit later in the service today. And when I've been looking online and looking at it, there's all kinds of kindness challenges that are out there. And 
I think one of the, some of the kindest ones are say that if you're kind to people, they will be kind back to you. Well, many times that is the case. How many of you can think of someone at least that you've been kind to and they are not kind back to you? Have you experienced that? And that person might even be in this building here, but don't look at them right now, okay? <laughs> Could happen. Even though we're kind to someone does not necessarily mean that they're going to be kind back to us. And uh, so really, we realize that our goal has to be more for our relationship with God. So doing good and loving God are something that we talk about. Uh, so in other words, when we share bread with the poor, that is the reward itself, knowing we've been obedient to God. What's the song we just got done singing? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. If you have invited Jesus to be in your heart, and I know so many of you have, if you've invited him to be the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life, then your desire will be to please the heart of God. So one of the things that he has asked us to do is to be kind to the poor, is a passage we're reading in Proverbs, but we're going to see it's much more than just that, is to be kind to one another uh, and uh, to do that. In fact, let's take a look at at, um, at Luke 6, verse 31, Jesus talked about it a couple places in the New Testament. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Notice it doesn't say do good things for others so that they will do good things for you. That's really what happens uh, in this world. In fact, watching my, even my children grow up, particularly in their young adult years, I'd be hearing them talk. They'd say, well, Dad, I've got to do this because I owe them a favor, Right? Don't we hear that language? I did a, a good turn for you. Uh, you, you now do a, do a good turn for me. And, uh, and once I've done something, I wait and say, you owe me. You owe me. Case in point. Very cold the other night. Very, very cold. Uh, and uh, I got home. I don't know if this was Friday night, Saturday night, maybe, whatever the case was. But I got home, and I thought I need to go work on my driveway only to have my neighbor Justin come and knock on the door and say, Larry, could I snow blow your driveway? Oh, let me think. Uh, yes. <laughs> I owe Justin. But that's not why he did it. I know. I know. He, I, I know it's out of the kindness of his heart, and he's going to be embarrassed that I've, that I've done this to him, and I didn't ask him permission because he just said no, so I just I don't anyway. <laughs> Quid pro quo says that I've got to do something to match that, but I know enough about Justin's heart to, to know that, that when he does stuff, he does it for Jesus. In fact, he's already done enough kind things that I don't think I'd be able to, to, to repay that. Uh, and, and so you get, an under, you get to understand what's coming on. When you're on the recipient of kindness, can you receive it? It helps when you're getting older and not moving very well and it's like two degrees outside. It helps to receive kindness that time. But think about it. Can you, can you receive it whenever you're on the, the other end of that, realizing that that person cares about you and whether they care about you or not, they're at least doing it for the glory of God because God has, has either tugged at their heartstrings or in some shape or form. I, uh, I'm not going to be, I'm not preaching out of Luke chapter 6 today, but I'll tell you what, I really have it on my mind, and, uh, and I'm going to read to you a little bit. I won't have it for you on the screen, but I just want to read to you a little bit more of what Jesus says. This is in a, in a couple paragraphs where he's talking about love for your enemies. These are not new words for you. By the way, I don't think I'm ever preaching on anything that's brand new for you. The question is, are you being obedient to whatever you've known in the past and what you're hearing today? Listen to these words. If you love those who love you, what credit is that for you? Even sinners love those who love them. Isn't that the truth? There are all kinds of people out there that will do something for, for someone else, the ones they like. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Oh, that starts to make us squirm a little bit, right? But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind 
to the ungrateful and wicked. Oh, if, they could, if I could just cut that phrase out, if I could just get that out of my Bible, that would be a lot easier to live. So God is kind, basically, to wicked people and ungrateful people, people that I somehow almost wish didn't exist, okay? Why? Because I believe that the unmerited favor and goodwill of God is that he's given everyone a chance to repent. Why is there such wickedness in this world? We just addressed this. Some of us addressed this Thursday night during Alpha, uh, and, and we were careful not to answer that because at Alpha at the moment, we're not providing all the answers. We're just learning how to express our, our concerns with each other. But my concern was kind of why, why God allows evil to get so bad before he seems to pull the plug on it, you know? But I know the answer because I'm reading the scripture, and I know the answer, and I can do that answer here. That answer is because he is waiting for all men and women to respond to him. It is wicked out there. But the scriptures tell us that God is kind to them and to the unfaithful. He's kind to them and shows them mercy should they ever want to respond, okay? How much more do you think that he has that for you and for me uh, whenever we're learning how to do this? So let's go back to the idea that there is some quid pro quo maybe in all this. I uh, read about a, uh, about a woman who was uh, head of uh, Wired Word. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that. It's, it's a publication that I've gotten off and on in the past. But what it does is it takes news articles, uh, recent news articles, and it presents the articles, and then it takes the scriptures and kind of guides you as to some of the questions you might want to start asking according to what the what God's written word says about things like that. It doesn't give you the answers, but it gives you scriptures to research. She had said that, uh, and she was having a hard time saying this out loud, she doesn't always get excited by being in church and, and, and being part of worship and listening to sermons. Oh, I have never heard anything like that. She does not always get excited about that. But she had read uh, Gary Chapman's book on, on uh, love languages, and she had discovered that her love language is service to God. In other words, the way she expresses her devotion and heart to God is whenever she is doing anything for the heart of God. Yes, she likes worship. It's not that she's not going to be there. But she knows that the time in which she, she is the closest to God is when she's serving in his name and, and she basically understands the blessing that she gets. So there's a little bit of quid pro quo, but that's a positive thing in that because she understands the blessing is coming from God. Uh, the quid pro pro, or pro quo, is uh, it's okay, isn't it? It's okay that we get a little bit of a reward by following Jesus. You know, in that sense, it, you know, it feels good uh, to serve God and his people. But, and Jesus doesn't condemn being, being good or being rewarded for doing good. Take a look at Matthew 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you are trusting and obeying, the scriptures do say there's a, bit of a, there's a reward. However, if you're seeking the reward and not seeking God, you'll probably lose the reward. Does that sound okay? That's where we're at. If you're seeking the reward and not seeking God, you'll probably never experience that. Whatever satisfaction you get on this earth will be the end of that uh, in, in that shape or form. Okay. So how do we get around this whole thing? How do we understand it? How do we get beyond it, I mean? When you and I act and do the right thing, whether it be feeding the poor, whether it be lending money, whether it be giving money, whether it would be uh, uh, providing a meal, whether it would be for doing a kindness, whether it be for snow blowing driveways, whatever we do it, we do it in order to please God. Trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and to obey. When you and I do that, you may or may not see the benefit at first, okay? You know, I can think of some people I've been kind to and, <laughs> and I can't see a lick of difference in their lives. I can't. I can't. And when I name your name, please stand up right now, okay? There we go. <laughs> Just because I'm kind doesn't mean it's going to change everything. But you know what it does? It changes me. Because I began to know what God has been wanting for me all along. And that is a sweet 
And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I give God thanks for that in that process. It may not change everyone around us or change the one we're kind to, but to a certain degree, when kindness is being expressed various places, the people around that kindness tend to flourish, both the ones who act that way and the ones who receive that at that same time. Which brings me to what we've been talking about. Uh, we're talking about the 30-day kindness challenge. And I'm going to spend a lot more time on this next week, uh, but I just wanted to introduce it. Also, I want to challenge you. Uh, if you would, uh, some of you are probably have a new Bible reading schedule you might be working on for the new year. Or if you haven't started reading, might, might you su I suggest that you pick out uh, a couple of the Gospels to read this week. And, and you might want to write these down to remember, but Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that's the Sermon on the Mount, okay? I think uh, one of the Sunday school classes, I think, is working on Matthew. If you could read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I think it will be helpful for next week. Secondly, uh, if you read uh, only one chapter, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 is also has a lot of the same Sermon on the Mount things right in that, that very chapter. And uh, that's where we're going to be in the scripture next week. And I think you'll find it really well if you can read up on that and see how much is there that Jesus taught about. But... Uh, Basically, what, basically what we're learning from, from the 30-day from the kindness, and I started this, by the way, as of today, I, I've got an email that's coming to me from the 30-day kindness people suggesting ways in which I might be kinder. In other words, if I pick a target, someone that I want to improve relationship, it might be someone I have a good relationship with or someone I have a bad relationship with. It doesn't matter. But if I would like to see that relationship improved, if I take the 30-day kindness, I have the, or 30-day kindness challenge, I get to do it. And I've got a picture of Shanti Feldman here, along with her husband Jeff. Uh, Shanti is a is a social researcher, in other words, of social relationships, and particularly her husband Jeff. They've done a lot of work in marriage, but she's the writer and she's the researcher, the one who clinically can do the research and and then do the tabulation for that. Those of you who have ever gone to school and happened to take a statistics class, she's good at it. I guess that's the best way for me to be able to say it, all right? And uh, so this is a couple that's been working on this very kind thing. And uh, in fact, I got another picture of the book here, and I have the copy of that book here with me. It's called The, the Kindness Challenge, 30 Days to Improve Any Relationship, okay? Kindness Challenge, 30 Days to Improve Any Relationship. So here's what I wanted to do. I wanted you to just hear what she had had written here, and uh, by the way, this, this book, like any other book, costs too much, uh, and uh, you, but you can get it on Amazon, no problem if you want it, or you can just go online and sign up to take the challenge sometime, and you'll see much of what we have even in the book here, okay? But here's what she says, and I think it's worth reading here. Once again, I'm reading Shanti Feldman here. If you're like the majority of those we've surveyed over the years, a few things are true. Most of your people problems don't stem from the big systemic issues, but from the little ones. Think about this in marriage, folks. Most of the issues aren't the, the big ones impossible to solve. They come down to little things many times. You don't like living with difficulty and strain in your personal life, in your workplace, or in society at large. You are willing to show more graciousness, kindness, and generosity to have better relationships, but you're busy. You're stretched and frustrated. You may think some little act won't matter. Or you've tried everything you can think of and those things haven't worked. Perhaps you don't know how or where to start to the end result. And show the end result's the same. You're living with a contentious situation and that is reducing your enjoyment of life. Just look straight at me right now. Do you know what she's saying is absolutely true, isn't it? We've learned somehow to live a contentious life, but we don't have to like it in, in that process. So that brings me to the challenge here. I've got a nice picture of a really cute couple with their side to work on each other, by the way. And, uh, and should you decide to take the 30-day challenge, in fact, don't do it today. You know, if you're just seeing this today, you really need to let this marinate, see whether or not this is of God or if this is just Larry being out there in the left field, okay? But I want you to think about it because I know... This is for me. Pick a target, someone which you would like to improve your relationship with. If you're married, it might well be that person. Um, if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, it might be that person. Could be a parent. 
that you're struggling with. It could be a child that you're struggling with. It could be an aunt and uncle. It could be the neighbor across the street. Um, if you're in the workplace, it could be your boss or it could be a co-worker. You pick the target, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then you do three things. I've got them different colors here. Nix the negative or avoid all negativity. When I work through this process, I realize that, that if I'm going to target someone, and by the way, it's, it's uh, none of you right now, so I want you to relax. You don't want me coming and saying, uh, hey, Gary, you're my, next, uh, you're my next project, man. Like that relationship anyway. Nix the negative. In other words, whoever you're targeting with kindness, can you go 30 days and not show any kind of negative behavior? I can't. Can I go 30 days and not go, oh, brother? Or when one of the kids come in, or grandkids come in, and, they, and, and, and I, you know, if I've targeted one of them, and, and I go, you know what? That's negative. Not to mention the mean things that we say as well. So this 30-day challenge is to pick a target and to eliminate all negative speaking, action, and thoughts. By the way, if you don't think you need to pray through this, you're kidding yourself. Because you're going to find out that probably you're not as, not as kind as what you think. I like to keep saying this like, like I'm above all this stuff, you know. I'm sweating this one out right now. I just want you to know that, okay. I'm even lucky God allows me to say this stuff out loud. Secondly, think of something positive about him or her every day. And tell him or her as well as telling someone else. Every day. Some of you do diaries really well or you journal really well. If you were to keep a journal of those thoughts in 30 days, I wonder what God might do in our relationships. Thirdly, do one kind thing for the, the person every day. Every day. And by the way, if you fail in one of these one day, you start again the next day. You get how that works, right? At the end of 30 days, here's what her research says. They've had countless people doing this, and then they follow up with it as well. You might do it online, or you might say, I'm not doing anything online, but I'm willing to consider doing this on my own, and I'll have more of this for you. And I hope you really maybe wait a week and, and think about this, because, because you know what? If we were to start this 30-day challenge on January the 16th, I think that's Tuesday, a week from this Tuesday, on January 16th, do you know when that 30 days would be up? On Valentine's Day. That 30 days would be completed on February the 14th, which is also Ash Wednesday, by the way. You know, guys, here's the thing. You can really take your girls on a date by bringing them to church that night here, okay? All right, we'll be here. <laughs> 30 days, maybe starting January 16th. You got a week to think about this, okay? But... People who have taken this challenge, 89% of the people who took the challenge feel like their relationships have improved during that time. Do you have any medicine out there that sounds any better than that? 89%. We've been selling the bill of goods lately, by the way, that, that it's impossible for marriages to do well. And it's wrong. For 30 years, the experts have said it. I'm telling the experts, they taught me to say it. I've told it to others. And God forgive us for it, because we never checked out the evidence on it. We've been telling everyone that half the marriages end in divorce. They do not. The research is coming out now saying, we're not, they, they've traced it back to where they think that was first started back in the 70s somewhere, but they do not. Really, when the truth is matter, about all the people who are ever married, maybe about one-third of those have broken up. And also, the people that are married a second time, we used to tell them, that, that's even worse. It is not. All right? And if you went to church last Sunday, there is only a 25% chance that you are heading toward the divorce. We've been selling people as good like there's nothing they can do. And I'm here to tell you, by pursuing obedience, trusting in God, it does makes a big difference in all of our relationships. Kindness is God's tool. If you will let it, it will be your superpower in the year 2018 only because God has already ordained it. It will melt down 
walls around you. 30 days. Will you pray about that over this next week? Let me know what you're thinking about. If you want to look up, if you, if you want to look up the, um, can we go back to her, her book, D, the, the slide right before it where we can see the book that she has? This is Shanti Feldhahn, F-E-L-D-H-A-H-N, The Kindness Challenge, 30-Day Kindness Challenge. If you just Google 30-Day Kindness Challenge, she'll come up right away. There are other kindness challenges out there, but just note that this one really is looking for the blessings of, of God, looking how God wants to work in our relationships, okay? But just check that out. Begin to explore that. Begin to think and pray whether or not God would have you join that. And uh, let's see what he will do in this new year. And all God's people said... Yeah, a few of you believe it anyway. That's good to know. We are blessed to be able to offer the sacrament of Holy Communion here, of communion here in the new year. And uh, as we get ready for that, just a reminder to you, uh, I'm going to ask my brother Lee to come up as well. But as we get ready for this, a reminder to you that, that if you truly and earnestly repent of your sin, if you're asking Jesus to be the forgiver of your life and the leader of your life, your Lord and Savior, then the sacrament is open to you. There will not be perfect people joining in this sacrament together, but we will be a people who are honoring God with our hearts and minds. Um, and uh, in order to get ready, just a little bit of time of prayer would be good. I invite you to, to uh, just close your eyes, bow your head, and for a few moments here where you just... See if there's anything standing between you and God today. Invite him to be the leader of your life. Ask him to forgive your sin. Remember that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God for his forgiveness. Amen. It was on the night in which Jesus was betrayed that he had taken the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread. He said, this, this is my body broken for you. When supper was over, he took the cup as God's blessing, and he said to those with him, this is the cup that holds the blood of, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this, all of you, in remembrance of what Christ has done for you. Let's pray. Lord, for the, for the cup the grape juice, the bread. We consecrate it for a very special use. It's, it's more than saying thank you for our food, Lord. It's like saying thank you for our salvation. Use this holy act in order to help our witness, to help us grow in you, and to be part of the body of Christ. To make us one, Jesus, like you prayed over your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come at this time. When you receive the bread, you may eat the bread. Uh, you do not need to hold it. And when you receive the cup, you may drink from the cup. Let's worship together.
poured out for you. Drink in remembrance of him. cold day but you did and God has been blessing us while we've been here now go in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen Amen